everybody. Welcome to the Party Chat Peoples. My name is Savi, and I uh, I got my hair dyed. It looks real mm -hmm. nice. With it's got you know, the silver letters on it now. Branding, you know, mm -hmm. that's because people are brands now. That's uh, that's going to be the new Fourteenth Amendment thing or Thirteenth Amendment, whatever it was. Anyway, we're way uh, higher than that on amendments, but whatever. Anyway, you hear the, 25th uh, is the presidential one. Yeah, so James is back <laughs> with uh with a nice projector for his virtual background. Uh, does it still count as virtual? And then no. <laughs> It's an actual Stacey background. There. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> an actual background. Not an actual background. Uh, yeah, so we're going to talk about a couple of quick news stories about uh, a potential new controller for the Xbox, new Xbox, um, and also about Epic Games buying a small company called Rad that most people haven't heard of, but it's kind of interesting buy on their part. Then we're going to talk about our games and stuff. I'm going to talk about Beyond Eyes, which is a relatively short game about a blind protagonist. Then James is going to talk to us about Threadbare Stitch Punk RPG and RPGs in general. And finally, Zavi's going to close it out with a review of 13 Sentinels. Not a review. I'm going to talk about it a bunch. I see. I see. <laughs> so there might be a review review later. Is that what's what's happening? I, I don't review stuff. I'm not. A, they don't pay me for this shit. That's true. That's <laughs> there is true. no day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's a review bullying. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> um, I do want to sort of, I guess, review Beyond Eyes, but let's start with the news stories first. Uh, you had them up on your screen, I think, Savvy. Yep. Yep. The news so, <laughs> beep, 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 beep. Yeah, let me keep uh, keep the sh screen share going on sure. so that uh, we'll just follow these links right here. Right. So first one we've got here is an interesting bit of news regarding how uh, Xbox is going to try to to be a PlayStation, right? Well, okay. So they want to license the technology from Immersion Corporation, and these are the same guys that came up with the tech for the new PS5 controller, which is for me a big selling point for the ps5 it is uh got some cool technology both in terms of the audio in the controller but also this haptic feedback and that's that's what immersion is good at uh, having multiple points of feedback and having so much control over what kind of feedback you receive is very very cool uh and apparently for people who were early purchasers of the new xbox uh, they were sent out uh, a survey that very directly asked them about their opinion of the controller and whether they might like a PS5 type controller more. So this is voting very well for Immersive, which is where this um, article came from, from a financial standpoint. But I'm more interested in, wouldn't it be interesting if Microsoft upgrades their controller after their console's already been out for a little while? What do you mean yeah, that, that they sure. want a PS5 controller? Do you mean by like layout or is there like very different functionality between them? There is. Uh, the biggest review, the, the, I would say the biggest highlights of the PlayStation 5, other than it being another generation of uh, operating system, like quality of life improvements, right? Uh, is the controller. Um, it's a significant jump. Um, it took a lot of the same like technologically leaps that like mobile phones have made in the last while. Um, and yes, as, as one of the 3% of controller. the US population who has a PS5, can you please expound upon this as a PS4? <laughs> That's true. I guess I'm a unicorn. Awesome. You are a unicorn. Um, We're both unicorns. Yeah, so. So let me, let me start by saying you're seeing these button controllers uh, on the back of the control in this photo. And one of the big deals is that they can change how pressure sensitive those buttons are. So it can be just as easy to click as always, or even easier than you're used to, real simple. Or they can make it feel like pulling yeah. back a bowstring, give it a lot of tension, and then yep. a hard release. And so if you actually take a look at the Xbox Elite controller, uh, like which I've heard about that. I've actually got the, this guy right here, right? Um, Isn't that a steamy? It's, uh, it's an interesting device, particularly because know. it has these uh, switches on the back. I don't know how well they'll get picked up by the camera, but you can hit yeah. these switches here, which actually make this trigger be very hair trigger. And then this guy, if you pull it back up, now it's a full trigger and there's a halfway point. So mm -hmm. 
like it's an expensive ass controller, the Xbox Elite controller, and right. I'm sure that it's mostly for professional gamers and largely was just Microsoft just doing R and D, right? Right, they're um, doing research, and I think it's important to say that having to pull a switch on the back of the controller is very different from allowing the game programmer exactly. to on on the so, fly make these changes depending on say what weapon you pick up. So that's exactly right. The Elite controller is cool because on a per game basis, and even if you're playing something very passive and not like time sensitive, even like just between different types of play, you can use those, the, the, you can configure the controller. I've actually been in Cyberpunk and I mess with it where when I'm driving, I might want a full trigger pull, but when I'm shooting, I might want a hair trigger pull. And that's nice, but with the PS5 controller, imagine a programmer being in charge of it. And in particular, the sensation that to me is the proof of concept of all proof of concepts is swinging like Spider-Man feels like swinging like Spider-Man for reasons mm -hmm. that I cannot fully explain until you actually get your hands on the damn thing. And so hopefully, hopefully, this means that the next generation or, or maybe the next elite controller is going to have it. Who knows how Microsoft is going to try to skew it yeah. But, uh, right. yeah, they're showing interest. Right. They're never going to be able to answer, you know, why wasn't it that way before? I think they were a little bit surprised by how far Sony got and just how well they did it. If you're used to the PS4 controller, you can pick up the new one and you're going to take to it very, very quickly. And it's pretty intuitive as to what's changed and how it's changed. Right. And for me, that found the old Sony controller just a little bit too large so that it was make a little difficult for my thumb. This one really alleviates that a good bit without seeming different to other people with larger hands. Yeah, the PS4 so. controller is a dream. It also apparently is going to be very easy to make to work with a PC. Um, there's probably going to be the Yay. usual amount of homebrew stuff that people do, but like apparently Sony, you know, th all these things are intentional, right? So like they apparently went by very common protocols so that this is going to be easy to even use a PS5 controller on PC. So is I think- Is that going to make it hard for like a third party controller market though? No, because it's like, eh, it's all, maybe. it's always up to, it's always up to like the software to, to standards, which can change over time and be updated very easily. What matters is the actual capabilities of the device itself. So I, don't, I would say, I, I want to back up on that because I think from an economic standpoint, being a Microsoft or a Sony, you will reproduce, you will mass produce these controllers because oh, no of question. the consoles. And have... then you can offer this controller at a lower price point They're to the gonna PC have... market. Because well, one of those things advantage. is that there was very few third-party PlayStation 3 or 4 controllers for the longest Mad Cats time. is still around, though. They still have their market, right? Like, but that's like, because I, um, if you're familiar with Ben Heck at all. No. So, so he's a popular, like, does like uh, video game hacks and stuff like that. Where he, like, he, if you ever saw back like, tw like 10 years ago, like the Xbox 360 laptop or the PS3 laptop. That was him. Oh, and like wow. he's okay, he yeah. did like handheld. The name versions kind of, of was ringing a bell, but I didn't want to. And one of the other things yeah. he does is he makes ex he he custom makes accessibility controllers for people who only have function in one of their nice. hands. So he makes right. left like full left-handed controllers and full right-handed controllers. Right, right. And I remember like a video years ago, he's like he finally found like a controller for the PS3 or 4, I think which one, I think it was the 4. They're like, he's like, all right, now I can tear this one apart and I can make accessibility controllers out of this third party controller. Right, right. Um, yeah, no, the, that's that's where third parties are always going to have the advantage is, is they're going to be able to make it modular. They're going to be able to make it for that community. They're, you know, it, it's always been the case that the official brand of controllers is the one that mom and pop buy. And that makes it just the market leader by default, no question about it, right? Um, what I think is exciting about this though is we, before you can have third party controllers even try to target advanced features, there has to be a lowest common denominator of these features existing in the mainstream controllers. And mm -hmm. you're really, when you're talking mainstream controllers, at least for America, you're talking the PlayStation controller, whatever the latest and greatest is, and the Xbox controller, whatever the latest and greatest is. And the Elite is too damn expensive. So I hope it actually isn't the next generation Elite that we're looking at uh, them acquiring that for. I hope that it's just the next skew they make for the Xbox Series X just has a really crazy controller that software people can take advantage of. And then game engines can make it really easy, right? Yeah, and yeah. that's, they, you know, when it'll start to pay off. 
that, yeah, the most important thing to me about this news is that if you're a game designer, you can now build a game for this kind of controller and it would work on an Xbox and a PlayStation and for PC users. So right. it becomes worth the money to put in that extra effort with programming. Yeah, and then seen... like two or three generations down the line, which you'll get the universal controller that comes with every <laughs> console. Yeah, no, that'll never they happen. stop fighting with each other. <laughs> it, honestly, that'll never happen. happen. Like the we, we've seen what happens when like the the, the real issue is that when they, when they uh, release Halo twenty six, that that'll be the that'll be the, <laughs> yeah. the the real issue I see is that games don't support enough different types of things, right? There are select games on PlayStation that will support mouse and keyboard, but we're at the point now with the game engines and with the Yeah, remember the, all the, the games standard, that use this thing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but but like, like five launch titles, right? But but like some kind of, but that can be abstracted. Like the the touch panel or the six axis can both be used as a pointer, and maybe the Xbox still won't have anything that's useful in terms of using it as a pointer. I think that's yeah. the biggest weakness of the Elite controller against the Steam controller. But like, if if eventually everyone has their own ability to like mix and match the abstractions, you can have. Zelda on the Wii, which Nintendo only gives a shit about their hardware, and it uses motion control and it makes the pointing stuff work really good. Other people will figure that out and they'll make it work on a six axis or sorry, a dual sense, uh, dual sense controller. Maybe this new Xbox controller, it'll have something that lets you do pointer functionality too. Like yeah. if, if you get the right the, abstraction. The gyro controller there, is much better on the PS5, but I kind of feel like it could be even better yet than that. In for sure generation yeah it still has like drift problems which are similar mm -hmm. to the problems that happen with the joysticks on the on the switch anywho so all right that was an acquisition <laughs> no no it's not an acquisition they're just licensing the technology they're not buying the company oh okay i just assume in microsoft which is maybe anyone. better because then you have an independent company that can sell to everyone right, the same technology and programmers can rely on that technology being there or they'll just but, buy them out later <laughs> yeah i hope not but we'll we'll see you know we shall see yeah so what was our other news story that's so the other about... news story we've got is epic games buys red what is red please tell us all right so the short version is rad is mostly known for two things one is helping video game designers package all their videos and graphic files together in a nice uh clear easy to upload way that then compresses everything and makes your game a little smaller. If you've right. ever seen this logo pop up before your game starts, Bink in Video. In the before times. <laughs> Bink Video. I mean, it's still there. It's just buried in like various credits. Uh, yeah, yeah. It'll, be a, it'll be at the end of the game now that you would see something like this. Um, yeah. And again, there it's generally technology that's been licensed by just about everybody at one point or another because it just makes the programmer's job easier. But it's interesting what's happening here is sort of like with Immersive, here's a company that is equally selling to everyone. And now they're gonna be bought out by Epic Games, which is in a giant war with Steam and has also got its own game engine uh, the Unreal Engine, which has a new version coming out later this year. Yeah, just in case anyone thought that uh, Epic Games was the unambiguous good guy in the shitstorm of Epic Games versus Apple. Here, here's your reminder that Epic Games is, is, is you know, does evil as well. <laughs> right. The only reason they're complaining about Monopoly is that it's not their Monopoly. Exactly. They would love to have their own, no doubt. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see if Rad's tools gets pulled away from other people. They're reassuring that that is not going to happen this year. Mm. which doesn't bode well for the far future. <laughs> <laughs> right. Suppose. So if you were planning to use their tool on a game that you're currently designing or just about to design, they're not going to pull it away from you on short notice. Uh, but that could be one of the selling points of the Unreal Engine. It uses a very easy video uh, edition tool that then makes your game nice and small so you can pack it in and it takes less time to download and so forth. Right. It's, you know, it, this could be something where... Um, and to the extent that Bink was charging, they can roll that into the charge for the Unreal Engine in general, and that's one less thing that game makers have to buy. 
For sure, for sure. There's also just a lot of game engines out there these days, and this might be a case of something that was a, maybe a relative weakness in the Epic engine relative to things like Crytek or uh, Dice, uh, the, the development studio Dice has its own engine, like, you know, a lot of internal ones too, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure that we're going to see games made by the CD Projekt Red Engine that powered Cyberpunk in the future. Um, you know, because you build these tools it, partly because you want to license them. And it could be that this is like a problem that's been solved so many times by now that like this may not really hurt the game developers very much because maybe every engine has its compression Some thing things. and they're good enough, you know? Yeah, so. and I would say bandwidth issues feel less pressing than they did a few years ago, but of it all with the caveat that that depends where you live. Here in New York City, where you can choose between multiple uh, service providers that'll give you a high bandwidth, it's kind of no big deal as to whether a gig is, uh, whether a game is one gig or 10 gigs. Mm -hmm. But in uh, rural America, where they're still relying on relatively slow internet service, it can feel like a big difference to them. Yeah, for sure. In, in a long game, I see it potentially mattering because video is huge. And if you have the best compression in your game engine, that's going to drive people there because you might want to sell your game on Switch and have a really nice looking video. And honestly, download times on something like the Switch really, really matter because yeah. it's actually a mobile device. <laughs> okay, so I feel like that's good enough around news. We're always forward looking as to not just what's going on right now, but what's going to happen later down the road. And yes. uh, the first one sounds good. The second one, not as good, but with all these things, we have to wait and see how they pan out in the future. Yep, yep, yep. Now on to the games. The games. The games. Yeah, so I want to talk about one called uh, Beyond Eyes, and I want to change my virtual background to what the game looks like, because I think that's helpful. Uh, Beyond Eyes is about a character named Ray, and this is what Ray's world looks like. Uh, and I'm going to move for a second so you can see, uh, actually I'll go the other direction. You can see there Ray uh, with her cat, which she is named Nani. And uh, she loves a cat who just walks in from the outside one day. She treats it well, and it comes back almost every day for a year, and then it suddenly stops coming. And uh, Nani, who, I mean, sorry, Ray, who is blind, then does something relatively brave and she goes to try and look for her missing cat. Uh, this is another picture of Ray. Uh, so you can see Ray is um, blind and that her eyes are mostly closed. I don't think they're entirely closed. It's more like if you let your own eyes, eyes drift, like you're just about to fall asleep, but they're just a little bit open. You can see a little light come in. I think that's the way that Ray is seeing. And if you look behind her at this kind of white expanse to the right of the house, or you can see a little better in this image, Ray lives in a world where her immediate surroundings are, are visible and make sense to her. But outside that area, she's just not quite sure what's there until she moves. Mm. Um, so this becomes very difficult for her as soon as she leaves her you know, carefully cultivated home and garden, which is safe for her to walk in. It's very clear where she can and can't walk. Uh, but once she leaves the gate, she has to deal with things like traffic and <laughs> dogs and, uh, you know, trip hazards. But uh, I will say it does not treat her like Mr. Magoo. If anybody's seen the really old cartoons, they started out black and white uh, of the dude who was blind. And I'm glad for that because it felt like always the joke was on him, even though he usually survived right. whatever terrible things he accidentally uh, wandered into. You know, mm -hmm. he'd just escape unscathed and everyone else would be. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Magoo was, was walking a weird tightrope between laughing with him or laughing at him. <laughs> right, yep. And it was partly just an excuse to use the mechanics of cartoons at that time. Like, mm -hmm. uh, Roadrunner and Wile E. Coyote. If Wile E. Coyote ran off the cliff, he wouldn't fall until he looked down and saw what happens when you're blind, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's sort of like it was a way to play on their existing fantasy. True, pictures. yeah. It's like you're, you might be in the head of that character, 
uh, and the things that seem exaggerated are just kind of putting you in their head, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I would call it, uh, I've called this a solution in search of a problem. Uh, they found yeah. a funny twist on their, you know, pratfall comedy, and then they made a character to take advantage of that twist. Mm -hmm. And that's something I see with video games that has troubled me in the past. They come up with some interesting game mechanic. And because it's just too weird for a normal person to have that ability or yeah. react in that way, they find some disability other, which might theoretically kind of plausibly create that effect. And what they end up doing is misrepresenting that disability pretty bad. So this game doesn't do that. The designer actually um, built the game after spending a good bit of time with somebody who really is blind. Um, and I think they did an excellent job. Uh, the only difference for me personally, as someone who's blind, is that you, this white expanse is very pretty and it's very arty and it kind of brings this beautiful watercolor feel to the game. But um, I actually will see some amount of light and some amount of color even at a distance. I just don't know what it means. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, just a, a quick primer on blindness because I feel like it, it makes sense to put it here. Like, so this is me mm. with my glasses on. Uh, this is why I talk about Mr. Magoo. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I can't see with them on the same way when I take my contacts out, I can't see with them off. Um, if you look at them from the side, uh, the actual glass ends quite a bit away from the plastic, even though it's pretty thick plastic because just that's how thick the lens is. So uh, only 15% of people who are blind actually see nothing at all. You know, right. the stereotypical person who leaves their eyes closed all the time or who has them open all the time and just doesn't uh, focus because they, they can't see anything at all. And maybe Is there a value stuff. for it's like not... the 2020 scale that actually counts as like blindness? Uh, there is, I'll be honest and say, I don't remember off the top of my head what it is, not being good at remembering numbers. I know that I am double whatever that is so that mm. I'm super not allowed to drive without some kind of seeing aid. In fact, my uh, near-term vision is ridiculously good if I'm looking four inches away from my face. So in my own job, I have taken off my contacts before in order to oh, align the projector. Funny. Yes, because I can see so perfectly whether each pixel is exactly aligned <laughs> if I'm looking at it from very short distance. No, that's but funny because good when we recently job. opened up my computer together, uh, like I was like, on some level way more frustrated than you were because I was like, I can't read these damn letters. <laughs> that's your, that's, that's yeah. the flip side of it for you. That's your superpower. <laughs> right, right. So, so if only 15% of the people that are blind are, are blind in the way you think of it from the way it's portrayed in movies or television, um, most people are blind for, for a number of reasons. Some of it's biological like mine. I was born prematurely. Uh, some of it is due to aging. People gain farsightedness, uh, some of them, as they get older, which is why you see reading glasses in the drugstore. Uh, and then there are people who develop cataracts uh, later in life. And if they catch them early, that's great. But sometimes this progresses quite a while before it's caught and there's not really a cure for that per se. So. Uh, these are all causes for blindness. If you haven't asked around your friends and family, you probably know someone who is legally blind or functionally blind without um, seeing AIDS. You just don't know it. Yeah, this reminds me of my cousin who uh, learned that he was colorblind by playing so much Destiny 2 <laughs> that when he that when his wife watched and actually commented and was just like why aren't you going to like the thing that is in the ui that is screaming at you to go in that direction he right, was right. like what thing and then he, she was like how can you not see that and then they realized that he had a particular i forget which type but he had yeah. he had a color blindness where he was just like yeah i don't catch any of those hud elements which goes to show you mm -hmm. how much no matter what a game designer does like mm -hmm the actual interpretation of this interactive medium is, you know, very complicated, right? Right, yeah. Um, I will say one Wasn't thing about Was it because he this... just had a wacky colored character? <laughs> when my cousin, no, no, no. It was, uh, it's just, it, it's always about like one of the three types of, um, I can't remember if it's rods or cones, but um, one of the three types of, of like one picks up RGB basically, right? Mm -hmm. Like one of each yeah. type. Red and the green three is most common the colorblindness. Yeah, the three broad yeah, the three broad categories of colorblindness are usually like one specific one of those types being yeah. weaker, the signal's weaker for whatever reason. 
Yeah. So you don't distinguish it. Yeah. So uh, overall, I will say good job on how they handled this. Uh, Ray doesn't fall for laughs or at times when you don't think she really would. Mm -hmm. uh, she does at one point because she's scared, which makes total sense. Even a small child that sees could fall over when they're scared of something uh, and kind of not watching where they're going. Um, so it makes sense that that Ray would at that time. And it's a really uh, heartwarming story. And it only took about three or four hours for me to play, being very, very thorough about it. Uh, the only downside is this, like many 3D games that don't have super high resolution, made me motion sick. Um, uh. And if it was in VR, it'd probably be way worse. <laughs> <laughs> So I did have to stop on several occasions between what they would call chapters. When Ray leaves her home and goes out to the street for the first time, that's the end of the prologue, right, for example. So I would stop at these points where she's reached a new area and just kind mm -hmm. of like chill out, go watch something else, do something else for a while until until the sickness passed. Mm. This, this is very interesting from the perspective of like accessibility in a sense because like mm -hmm. it's a game about a character who isn't as visually able as everyone else and it actually goes through the trouble of like doing all the work with the shaders and the art direction and all that mm -hmm. good technical jargon mm -hmm. to like put you in their shoes yeah. but then maybe by doing something so novel it also might make you more motion sick if you're prone <laughs> to that because <laughs> right. like if i remember like you had no problem with ghosts ghosts is a sheep no not at all yeah. but for instance ray doesn't run because if she did that would be dangerous she can't see far enough ahead of herself to make running a mm. safe activity right. so she always walks mm -hmm. um and, it, and it's interesting the way they've made it seem from her perspective so to give an example there is a fountain in her garden uh, later, she hears another sound that sounds like rushing water, and you actually see the picture in her head of a fountain as being represented in real space. But as she gets mm. close to it, that picture fades away, and instead there's a sewer grate with water right. coming out of it, because that's what it really is when she gets close <laughs> enough to find that's out. That's cool, because I think so much of what's happened with like the David Cage games like doing good QTEs where they're actually like embedded in a game world. We've taken that so far now, like where the interface, interface design, I guess, in general in games is going in cool directions. And then in this particular case, like I, I, I think all modern interface design in some sense is like putting you in the, 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 the experience of that character that you're playing as, right? right? They're aware of how much health they have and they're aware of how much health the enemies have. So let's put bars over people's heads, whatever. Yeah. Um, but, in, but in this case, just like focusing so hardcore on the experience of like the, having the interface try to, try to like make you understand what it's like to even just think like this is actually pretty yeah. interesting because I dated a girl who like, thinks in images and the moment that she said that like i stopped in the middle of the street and i was just like what that, how so you... the guy who types and pictographs well now i do but <laughs> <laughs> but like uh, yeah so so this, this so this is like i think i guess i'm saying this sounds like a fascinating s study in interface design potentially yeah yeah hmm. and also just if uh you're interested in what it's like to live that way i would uh, recommend this game it's short and you will get a pretty good feel for it uh definitely if you had a relative or someone you care about and you're kind of curious what it's like in their shoes i recommend it um for everyone else it might be good too but uh the game is 15 dollars, even though it's several years old now it's probably not going to drop from that on a regular basis but if you wait until like a steam summer sale or winter sale you'll probably be able to get it for more like five bucks and that's more what feels to me like a perfect price for something this short but uh again if if you just want to know what it's like in another person's shoes and you're willing to fork out 15 bucks for it um it's probably worth the money mm, word yeah. Uh, us filthy Americans always, always measuring the value with the time. <laughs> That's true. Uh, but speaking, speaking of value of for time. time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, what's so funny? No, I'm really seriously, tabletop RPGs, some of the best value for money you can get. Really. But also, they take so long to play. So. How much is your time worth? 
right. how much is your time worth? Mm. And maybe you can save a lot of time if you play Threadbare. Or this class of RPG. So yeah, I told you we'd talk about Dice one of these days, Stacey. Mm -hmm, you did. All right, how do I share my <laughs> you, you pushed a button that says sharing. There it is. This one. I believe in you. There we go. All right, so today I want to talk about this game. That Threadbare, is adorable. Which is a Stitch Punk RPG. But before <laughs> I can talk about that, we I need to explain about... what stitch punk is. Can we stop for a second? It's kind okay. of intuitive. Okay, so we everybody knows what cyberpunk is, right? At this now point, I think most people do. Um, so then you've got steampunk, which is based on steam technology and sort of earlier historical view of X punk. So stitch punk is a sort of dollification of the punk aesthetic. Is that safe to say? <laughs> Uh, Toy Story. It's it's more badass. along the lines of Toy Story and <laughs> like yeah. Brave Little Toaster. The right. the uh, actual story of this game is that however long ago, basically, all of the humans in the world just disappear. Nice. And so <laughs> like all their life is there and all the remnants of humanity is there, but all the all the humans are gone. They disappeared without like without a trace so this is like toy story and all apocalypse the toys woke up basically i know what was the last part and all the toys woke up so like it's, <laughs> it's essentially like toy story in the apocalypse yeah yeah okay. i i kind of love it already and you get to play such things as this teddy bear with a cape on because that sounds exciting to me yeah there are <laughs> there are three there are three character classes okay you have your plushies so it's like any kind of soft toy Yep. You mm. have your mecha, which is any kind of like plastic, metal, or hard toy. Mm -hmm. And then or you have socks. Here. Socks? Yes. Like little socks. sock puppets, <laughs> like hand puppets. No, well, literally socks. And one of the like mm. archetypes of sock is a sock puppet. Oh, so that's only one variety of socks. There are many other socks. Yeah. Okay. And I can get into that a bit because this is not your typical D&D. &D. Mm. This, this game system, because... What, what, what we traditionally think of Dungeons and Dragons or D&D &D is one, you know, it's, it is kind of like the bread and butter, like it is the most common because it's the, the headliner RPG, but it's, it's, that's a D20 system, like, and a lot of games are based off of that and kind of steal from D&D &D in that sense. This yeah, is a completely different system. This one doesn't teach me satanic rituals? I mean, I'm sure there's a version of it for that. <laughs> right, because Threadbare itself uh, is based on... Yeah, so this game is called a Powered by the Apocalypse game, as opposed to a D20 mm -hmm. system. And it's called that because they're all based off of this game, which is called Apocalypse World. And in mm -hmm. the same uh, sense, we're like, you know how, how much third-party stuff there is for D&D? &D? And now there's entire games that are basically using, that are just like reskinning the, the fifth edition rule set. Yes. And that's that's because originally Dungeons and Dragons is part of something like I think after third edition or maybe earlier, it's called the open gaming license. Mm -hmm. And that was originally so like third uh, pe third party companies could write adventures and supplements for D D and not definitely have to pay third edition. I don't know about a second edition. And do not. the D D owners get it get points off of that? No, that was the idea. Is that like, okay. we are going to let you make these things that are compatible with our game and not stab you for money? Right. Yeah, and right. the idea was to help popularize the games themselves by allowing amateur writers to publish, and they would create whole campaigns that yeah. could be the same campaign could be run by hundreds of different teams. Right. They made the decision to be a platform, not just mm -hmm. a game. Right. And I don't know if that's changed to be more open recently, because I've seen a lot of Kickstarters, which basically saying, like, wait, I'm making a game themed on this using the fifth edition rule set. Yes. So it is absolutely OK to, in general, print a game using fifth edition rules. You don't necessarily have to. But that wasn't as big a thing years ago. Like, I, yeah, I, I don't just... have the people doing that 10 years ago. That right. might just be people you like just... reverse engineering it. 
Yeah, you just can't use no, the they very... specifically say like using fifth edition rules or something like that. Right, right. You just can't use There's the very a... specific things like a particular monster in the monster manual. I have to make your own darn monster, okay. or things like that. But the and, rules but, themselves you can use, sure. And prior to like prior to it being a DD thing, this guy basically said, Oh yeah, I'm publishing this game and anybody can make their own game out of these rules. Mm -hmm. So the original game is Apocalypse World. And there are there is a game in just about every genre you can think of that uses these rules. So they're all called Powered by the Apocalypse. Nice. And so what makes basically uh, pick your it's it's almost like white labeling, right? Like pick your mm -hmm. aesthetic. You have a common foundation to work from. Yeah. Right. And so what makes Apocalypse World different from D and D <laughs> and other? Well, getting into that, uh, can you see this? I can. A guide yes. to role playing systems. Player. So start... All right. Who wants? To, we got to. We got to give out roles and do this play. Let's go. If you say so. All right. Uh, well, go ahead. I'll 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 start it out. Can I do the thing? Using mascots. Hey. Yes, you can do the thing. Gerps, fill out these forms in triplicate. Ooh, maybe I won't do the thing in that case. What about <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons? Yes, but it's not really worth it unless you are a dream elf with the god-blooded feet and at least five levels in the Thing Manser prestige class from Complete Thing. Or you could just play a wizard. They get the thing as a third level spell. I almost don't even want to do the thing anymore. I'm so confused. <laughs> All right, how, James, how about Call of Cthulhu? Can I do the thing? You can do the thing, but you really don't want to. <laughs> yeah, Cthulhu is pretty dark, man. It's, it's a dark business. Uh, so Zavi, fate, can I do this thing? Uh, that depends. Can you bullshit the GM into believing that one of your vaguely worded aspects supports you doing the thing? Probably, so I probably will do that thing. I'll, I'll try. <laughs> I'll at least try to do the thing. It sounds fun. Uh, James, how about 7th C? Can I do the thing? Only if it's properly dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> I like the way you sold that Pirates. one. I like it. Uh, Zavi, Shadowrun, you like this one. Can I do the thing? Yes, but you'll need a bathtub full of D6s. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to say this. Cyberpunk 2077 has a pretty dark bathtub, so I don't, That's... I'm not sure I want to do the thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so James, last one. Can I do the thing in Paranoia? The thing is treason. Get them! <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> And, I shouldn't uh, even mention doing the thing in paranoia. So these are, so these are all the totally different. Computer is your friend. Why would you want to do that to computer? <laughs> oh no! This so this is, is real rough, man. I, I like this script a lot, right? Because you have all these pen and paper games, and a lot of people enjoy doing pen and paper. But so much of the insistence on Dungeons and Dragons, I think, is just like pure momentum because people know it, right? Yeah. And switching from one system to another is very difficult if you don't have a gm that like you know brings you along real nice and all that stuff because it can they're be. totally different abstractions and if you don't have the brain for that and you just want to do like the fun storytelling stuff you just it's just it's bad <laughs> the trouble is that dnd is bad at that and I so i have played four of these games i have played dungeons and dragons three four uh three and a half four and five I have played right. Call of Cthulhu games, and I have I have played both Seven C and Shadowrun, and right. literally like how they let you do things is very different. And it, and how it does, does that compare to this other one? What was it Mortal World? Uh, what was it called Apocalypse World. Apocalypse, Apocalypse World. World. Well, Sorry, it falls along a line. Can, can I do the thing in a? Can I do the thing in Apocalypse World? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, yes I can do can. the thing. All right, cool. So, so that does sound like it makes it easier for sure. How do I make this overlay go away? Don't worry about the overlay. Just... Well, it's it's covering up the tab, so I can't click on things. Oh, no. I don't. We can't. You see can stop overlay. your sh Just... screen sharing for now, and then share it again once you have what you want. That might okay. work too. Yeah. yeah. Just let us see all uh... your dirty, dirty desktop. It looks, just looks like anime. It's, it's filthy. Not, I'm not too concerned. I, I'm I'm more, I'm more commenting on the number of icons. All right, so this looks like a character sheet. Yeah, and um, and one of the things that like all the powered by the all the powered by the apocalypse games generally are very simple and easy to get into. This is a typical character sheet, and they're called playbooks because in this case it's like it's four, it's like 
It's four half pages. I like pages that word. That and the like idea is that you print this out and you fold it so you have a little playbook because it's only mm. a, a single double-sided sheet. And what it does is it tells oh. you how to build the character on the sheet. Oh, I'm That's going to steal very this. very simple. Because... I love that the stats are cool, hard, hot, sharp, and weird. Yeah, and uh, oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> I forget where it tells you what that is. I recently uh, discovered yeah. that Here people... on the, on the fourth yeah. block of the sheet, sorry, yeah. it tells you how to build the character. Right. So to create your angel, choose a name, look, and you know stats. So choose the stats. It gives you four options for what your stats are. Cool plus one, hard, pl hard plus zero, hot plus one, sharp yeah, plus two, a, weird plus one. It's a one pager. <laughs> That's for the sure. thing. And it, it's so much easier than d, &D already. Mm -hmm. Like you can spend a couple hours even just building a first level character. Well, for and D &D. this is, yeah. and it's the sort of thing that like video games are so much better at than d d which, mm -hmm. you know, partly because they're, it's possible because of a computer that's helping, uh, but also just from design. So this right. is nice that this right. is circling back now. And, and yeah. I love how it ends with you actually go around with the other players in your team and you talk about each other and depending on your opinions of each other, it changes your stats further. Mm. Well, that's pretty neat. That's cool. Yeah. If I'm reading so that correctly. Uh, yeah. I think so. All of, in these games, they're very you know character and party focused. So you yeah. always have a tie to, in theory, either the people sitting next to you or everyone at the table, depending on the players there are. And mm. so you, every character has an inter-character relationship with another character. Right. And mm -hmm. depending on how you use those relationships or those relationships change during a play session gets you bonuses at the end of the session. Oh, neat. This is cool because when you, when you typically read a pen and paper book like Shadowrun or D and D, you have to ingest a stupid amount of rules, and then you need to decide, as the game master in this thought experiment, how you intend to onboard your players to whatever it is that you're going to do. And eventually, if you've done it twenty times, you probably like you know are able to wing it. But like, that's a that's a one pager. <laughs> like you can send that over to someone in a Google Doc and just be like take five minutes to look at this and then when we do it together it'll just breeze by yeah and all the characters are this way mm -hmm. um and then the other thing is so getting back into that uh what 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 can you do so mm -hmm. D, D is kind of based all in its like it's it's primarily a combat system so all the stuff that's not combat is very kind of like it's relegated to this very niche aspect of play Mm -hmm. okay. so it's like you know i make a skill check and it's very like do i succeed do i fail yeah a good example of something that shadow run in the rule book spends time on that i really like about shadow run is the rules for what happens between runs you need to th there's rules you, you know game masters can ignore them if they want for like you need to pay for your for your lifestyle you know right. and you don't live for free <laughs> and and by you can almost think of the surface area of a literal book, but also kind of of like all the procedures in your head, and be like, what surface area is taken up by combat versus other stuff, right? But that's all regimented in what you can do, right? It's like you have to do these specific things. Mm -hmm. And the, one of the things I was getting at is when you play D and D, it's you look at your character and say, well, what can I do in this situation? What am I able to do? When you play a game like this, it's, well, what does my character want to do? And these games are very creative and freeform in how you do these things. And I actually messed myself up when I went back to play Pathfinder because I played several of these games. Mm. So what you, um, all the, all the roles in this game, except for maybe damage are 2d6 plus your stat. Mm. And what decides the specific stat is basically what you want to do. And the stats and, have what value range? Uh, usually minus two to plus three. Okay. That's a pretty small range. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes like that's what they'll start at. They'll start somewhere in that range. A lot of times you'll have a, a minus one, a zero, a plus one, and a plus two for like an average spread. Yeah. Like yeah. and that depends on which character. So you go back if you if I look back at the playbooks, different characters will have different spreads for d different stats. Mm. Or different spread options. Mm -hmm. yep. um, but so in this game, instead of it's like, well, I 
use my this skill to do that. It's like, well, I would like to, uh, you know, try and do something. You know, it's like I want to get. In this case, I guess the one I'm reading off is like get a lay of the land. So it's like I I look out there and I want to, you know, what do I see? And in this case, whenever you like say something you want to do, there's a there's the games all have what's called a basic move sheet, mm. and they're kind of general ideas that you can it's like well which one of these is the closest to that so i want to like you know look through my binoculars at the enemy compound what do i see and the most common one is like right here read a sitch read a situation mm -hmm. all the games typically have a move like this and it's when you want to read a charge situation or you know try and understand something so you read a sitch read a person but in this case mm -hmm. it's um and what you do is you roll your 2d6 and this game has a very gradient of success for all the roles. Since you're rolling 2d6, it's uh, that words. <laughs> well, if you're yeah. doing. Yeah, I could just more or less repeat it. If you get a 10 or higher, you can 12. ask three questions. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. On a and seven to nine, you can ask one question. And below that, you can ask a question anyway, but be prepared for the worst. <laughs> right. And I think it's a there's a there's a really clear pattern here of like categorizing things into very abstract buckets and just trusting players to figure out like what the right thing to do is right. But they all follow a very basic pattern of roll dice gradients of results. Mm -hmm. And another and it, yes, and I just want to say it does it so much more simply again than D and D five E where. You know, we have the bizarre situation where somebody rolls for attack and they go, is your armor class 34? And it's like, that's such a ridiculously high number. Yeah, you hit me, whatever, man. Mm -hmm. um, but it just feels like number inflation can hit other role-playing games. Yeah. And Shadowrun has its own issues with many, many D6s, which the latest edition is trying to resolve. This is just maybe it's not because about it's a relatively, <laughs> well, eh. anyway. <laughs> When it's not about that. Um, maybe just because this is a relatively new um, way of doing things, it definitely feels so simplified compared yeah. to a lot of other games. And mm. like in this system, like anywhere between a seven and nine is is a success, but it's not always a full success. It could be a partial success, um, and like even a six minus could be you could succeed for narrative reasons, but you'll have like bad like extremely bad things will happen like it says on a miss you can ask a question but the question you ask you may not get a truthful answer or you mm -hmm. may you, or you may get an answer that appears true so it's right. like you know who's in control here if i if i roll a six under mm -hmm. you know it's like it may point to somebody who's not actually in control it's like you would right. be like deceived Right, and or, or that... other bad things could happen. Like maybe they do tell you the truth, but you're suspicious of them anyway. <laughs> and you make a jackass of yourself. I mean, there yeah. are a lot of ways this could backfire. And and, and, and even just the brainstorming that we're doing is evidence that like this system is really focused on the role-playing part, right? The negotiation mm -hmm. between game yes. master and players. And yeah. And this anything... example of one of the basic moves, sorry. Go ahead does like it um, explains that I think the best. So like on a 10 plus, you do it. On a seven to nine, you know, something happens and the, the GM or the master of ceremonies in this case can offer you a worse outcome, a hard bargain or an ugly choice. Mm. Yep, I've, I've handed that sort of thing to people before, but not in so many words. That's the mm. thing is that DMs always have the ability to do this kind of thing right. at, at their whim with any game, regardless of rules. Yeah, but the fact that they explicitly put it out there yeah. is going to encourage more creativity, both by the person right. running the game and also by the people playing it. Yeah. I mean, I think so much of like my issue with D&D &D really does boil down to they talk so much about stuff that I personally don't care about. Um, one of them being like super detailed fantasy style combat, right? Like th there's all the spells and all that stuff that that doesn't appeal to me. And some of that is personal taste, but, to, but on some level, like my average experience in the handful of D and D games that I've partaken in is that the moment that combat happens, it gets super boring to me. And not just that, like, like, 
not just me, the, di the dynamic shifts. People mm -hmm. stop role playing, hard stop, because that's the moment where such and such is going to take five minutes to figure out what he's going to do. And then such and mm -hmm. such is going to take three minutes. And then it eventually I have to do something and I can stop looking at my phone. Like that, <laughs> that dynamic is real. Like these are social yeah. games and it's sure. a problem in the game design that these, or I think it's a problem that, that there's such a hard difference in that context. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's the reason why some DMs keep their tables small. So there's only like mm. four players to kind of yeah. reduce the amount of time that each person spends waiting for other people to make a decision on what they're going to do. And mm. I, I've played in an eight player game before and like they had a system Oof. of logistics to try and mitigate that. Like right. Right. when in yeah, college that's they had, too we had up on the whiteboard, everybody like, this is your turn. I'm warning yeah. you, your turn is coming up. Figure out right. what you want to do. You could always see who was going when. Right. Well, it, it's yeah. like anything yeah. when you need to do, when you need to do like at scale, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you have to put in time constraints, right? Like competitive chess time constraints like so on and so forth and you know if you're gonna run an eight player game your choice is devise an entire system that works for your personal uh clique of eight people um or cut out the complexity in the game that you're playing <laughs> Yeah. Well, and that's what I wanted to ask, because it seems to me that as much as this cuts down on the number of crunching and number of inflation and all that, it could cause, if anything, more negotiation with the DM as to which category does the thing you want to do fall under and what would the consequences be if you don't roll well, mm -hmm. right? To what extent are they going to try and figure out the consequences before they decide whether to even roll those dice, right? Right. Well, usually the the way I've always seen it played is that you uh, like you can say a whole lot of stuff, and but until you say I do this, you don't roll any dice. Right. I like yep. when you get into combat. I mm. mean, it's kind of like you have like explicit code turn. words around that kind of mm -hmm. thing. So it's um, and then yeah, there is a level of negotiation. I have on in times gone was like, well, I'm trying to do this instead of using the stat that's listed. Can I use this other stat? which I'm better at because mm -hmm. I'm trying to do it in a different way. Mm -hmm. And a lot right. of times like, yeah, because you're, and because you, everything is a lot more free form and explanatory. It's like, right. I say, I want to do this and let's find a move that fits. Mm -hmm. And if you're trying to do it in a slightly different way, it's like, yeah, you can use that other stack because you're better at it because you're doing it that way. Right. Yeah. yeah I, I think part of what's smart about this is how much it eases off the complexity and just says, we cannot control how good the game master is. We cannot control the attitudes of the players. We just can't, so we shouldn't try. And I actually heard the Shadowrun creators talk a little bit on a podcast about what they did for Sixth World, the sixth edition of the game, and what their thought process was. And um, one of the reasons they felt in retrospect that they kept falling on the side of if it takes too long get rid of it like if it's taking everyone's time get rid of it was that they you know we're in an age where like people play on streams right so they have all this data of watching people play their game and where the dynamic drops right mm -hmm. like they're doing it live and it's like okay that person's not interested anymore like it, it slowed down here and what they realized is um nothing will ever make a game worse than like the players themselves and and they just have to throw their hands mm -hmm. up and just go you know what if the if the gm sucks we can't do anything about it if 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 this mm -hmm. player is being a, a total time hog and trying to meta game too much we can't do anything about it so simplify 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 yeah so have you played uh, apocalypse world or that threadbare I have, uh, yes, I've, I've played in a short campaign of Apocalypse World. I've played in a con game of Threadbare. I played in a long home game of, uh, it's called Dungeon World, which is the tip, is like the D&D esque setting of this game. And did those go faster, feel a little snappier, or how did those go for you? Or just the opposite? I mean, it could be anything. Well, I mean, you know. <laughs> we we definitely did a lot more like especially in uh mm. in the the non the other two the dungeon world and the apocalypse world it's like we got into like crazy adventures well so like we could... the the classic thing is somebody says i'm going to do a one shot with this this new rpg and and it takes three or four games to actually complete three or four evenings to complete that one adventure <laughs> that's pretty uh... typical with D D. 
I don't know because like we like those two games we were set in for like oh yeah we're gonna make campaigns out of these the con mm-hmm. game it was set up uh the, it moved quickly enough and we were able to move with it that you know like yeah it took the the three four hour span that it was supposed to right you know mm-hmm. it's I, I don't necessarily think we were pushed along. It just um, that particular adventure we were playing, yeah. uh, it was either woven into it to keep us moving, or it's we were just well, our characters were driven. I forget how it played. Right. Okay. It was, <laughs> but like it was still very fun, and we had a interesting cast of characters. I just I'll think imagine is... with, with the with the type of classes that you mm-hmm. have. <laughs> I, yeah. I think I just think that this would just keep everyone engaged a Still lot have more my on average. Yeah, yeah. I'm 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 kind of tempted to just invite a bunch of random players and, mm-hmm. and try to sound. What I am curious fun. about, if uh, if you could maybe comment on James, maybe to to wrap up the subject, is what gets sacrificed though, because that's that's always a trade off, right? If you're not going to have a complex system or as complex as D and D what gets sacrificed and you know some amount of sensibilities is there like some people just want the crazy super intricate combat rules of D and D whatever um what i think could get sacrificed is any sense of progression and i'm Mm. curious if that's true but also just generally well some of these games don't actually have progression right so uh, one of the things I forgot to mention before is that anytime you do fail a roll, you always get something, or you usually get something out of it. In the Dungeon World game in specific, um, if you you uh, because it's a D and D style game, you level up, and the character sheet you know like has options for leveling up. But in order to gain experience to level up, you have to fail rolls. So if you if you roll sevens to like seven to tens all the time, mm-hmm. you'll be a level one character for that whole time. Mm-hmm. So you will not gain abilities that mm. the other characters, the other players might have because you, you roll too well. Right. Huh. And um, but in th- so that game has leveling up and, and several of the other ones do. Threadbare doesn't. Threadbare, your character doesn't level up. It's like, this is your character. Yeah. Um, you can modify them and potentially give them abilities through like, you know, like, equipment or something maybe. Uh, well, I mean, like if you look at the cover here, it's like mm. all these toys are not original anymore. It's it's right. They're all praising up this teddy bear is because he's original. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, so they've sort this... of taken bits of other toys and added them to their bodies. And yeah. So if, if you remember, um, is it Sp- who's the who's the mean kid from Toy Story? Uh, Sid. If you remember Sid. Sid's room from Toy yeah, Story, yeah, he had the little crazy looking Frankenstein thing. Yeah, it's like you could like a lot of the toys in this world are that way, right? Mm. And <laughs> so like sense. you can like you can add stuff to your character and modify them and gain some abilities that way. But most of the time, is your a, character is your character. It's a different type of progression, right? Like that's almost more just like the role playing side again. It's more like your character has a life. I think what's missing, which I don't mind at all, is. Um, you probably in something like this couldn't necessarily pull off that sense of um, power creep, right? Then normally that's a negative mm-hmm. connotation, but like that yeah. has its purposes, right? Like literally being in combat when you were low level with something that could like squash you like a bug if, you know, if you try to engage with it so that you feel underpowered, but then maybe potentially in the future fighting something on its level and being like, oh my God, look how far I've come, mm-hmm. you know? And another interesting thing, an interesting thing about this game, which is another reason why I say it's like the opposite of D anD D, is that there is no combat at all. Hmm. Wild. In the so it, sense of D anD D, I guess you mean, right? Well, no, I mean there's there's literally People don't hit each other. Your with characters swords and cannot stuff. fight another character where you roll dice. Instead of like any actual form of combat, there is a move. For Threadbare specifically. Yes. So okay. each of these has their own specific move sheets, and mm-hmm. see if I can find it here. Fight song. <laughs> so you, you have a combat. sing off, for example. Or when you, you engage in a contest of violence, combat, performance, or sport, all characters take one damage. All characters who participate, mm. and they 
basically it becomes a montage scene. You say whether you won, or you uh, decide whether you won or lost, and you describe how it plays out. <laughs> and That's you can funny. decide to lose if it if that works for the narrative. Like if, mm, if you nice. get into a fight and you need that other person to win for whatever reason to make you like them better or so that they can succeed, yeah, you sure. can decide to lose. Hmm. That's kind of cool and and definitely a twist on the old. You know, that's why you have to roll dice in D&D, because that way you can't just automatically win every fight. Well, this one you actually can automatically win every fight, and there's still dice rolling. <laughs> but this game, it, this game in take, particular tries damage. to not let you do this. I mean, like, it, right. it would prefer yes. that you didn't. And that's why it's like, in, you know, Clearly. instead of a combat, it's like do uh, performance yes. or a sport. It's right. Like, right. Because you're they playing want to keep toys. it light. They don't know fighting. Well, and and right. playbook is the perfect analog because uh the, the like the the right term to capture it because um you know certainly for Americans at least like we're we know American football we know like that you have a playbook and and tactically what you do each round almost of of football is you pick a play and then a whole bunch of other stuff happens but at a high level like the decision has argue you know die has basically been cast in american football you know what i mean so i really like the 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 framing of this as like especially because it's in that foundation for apocalypse world and so i'm sure all the variants stay close to it where it's like no really we just want to give you this playbook and that's all you need as a player like you will never need to ask the the playbook to reference something usually gotcha cool I think I have a pretty good sense of this one, and it seems like at least uh, a definitely a fun switch up from your. And the, usual. the the adventure I played in the con was it was essentially um, a Mad Max adventure. It was a fu- it was yeah. it's called Furry mm-hmm. Road as opposed to Fury Road <laughs> because you're like toys and plushies. Oh, Very that's nice. so. Funny. And one of the other things about mm. this game, this game in particular, is it's played at three difficulty slash reality settings. Mm-hmm. And you, you pick that before you start. And, you know, the first one is, you know, like Sunday afternoon PBS special. Mm. <laughs> then there's nice. kind of like, That's funny. then like there's maybe like your uh, like half step between PG and PG 13, you know, so like, mm-hmm. like you, you might get into like scrapes and stuff. And right. then there's like full on, like, there's still no fighting, but R rated Toy Story. Toys are tearing each other, like toys are tearing each other apart for parts and stuff. And there's like deep politics, and they're they're betraying each other. (laughs) And we actually played this game, which like there's that one Barbie who keeps coming in and making a mess out of everything. (laughs) And we played this as like the PBS special in the con game, so like everything Mm. was like you know hearts and rainbows. Right. (laughs) We were. Sure. Like we were trying to transport, I think, like candy hearts or like toy hearts, <laughs> or like adult toys or something like that. Right, sure. Like we were like a band of, like we we were three socks and a teddy bear in a like wood burning shopping cart. <laughs> we had like a steam engine. That's funny. That's transporting hilarious. these things across the wasteland, of, like so that you can restuff the, the animals. So yeah. important. And yeah. then there was like. A mean toy who wanted to steal them for herself. Of course, it was like a it was a Raggedy Ann type toy. It was like, oh, who had an entire mob of toys trying to stop us the entire way, and it was like it, the the adventure ended in the Toys R Us where we were trying to help these toys, and we we gave like this evil Raggedy Ann respect and love, and she turned around and became the good person again. Oh my god, it's so saccharine. Weird. Yeah. And it was awesome. It sounds adorable, though. Yeah. But like, and there was like adventure within there because like it wasn't easy. You know, I was like, sure. We I, almost I, lost the shopping cart at one point. It was crazy. Part of what's smart about this <laughs> is that it, like making that one shot far more viable, especially with th- that that kind of option. Like before you play, decide what type of world it is. But even that has been something that the that the game is. Um, 
holding your hand and giving you explicit mm -hmm. choices. It honestly reminds me of when you pick your various difficulty levels in certain modern games. Mm -hmm. You're basically white labeling the game to your personal preferences, right? Mm -hmm. I don't like stealth, but I like combat or vice versa. And I think it's brilliant that for a role playing pen and paper game that relies so much on human imagination, they kind of took that same approach, but were just like, do you want rated R teddy bears? <laughs> Sure. All right. But we are threatening to do the thing that all role playing games do, which is <laughs> linger too long on one that subject. Is fair. That is entirely fair. <laughs> so I do want to move us on to the last one. So you thought you had a game you wanted to tell us more about. Yeah. Uh, James, if you could uh, stop sharing, I can take over. Um, I wanted to chat a little bit about a very strange game. 13 Sentinels. Um, I actually picked up this guy when I decided basically that uh, Vanillaware being nominated for a uh, best narrative was enough reason for me to basically like just shut up and take my money <laughs> right <laughs> because yeah. these guys made so many great action narrative games that i just love and so uh i decided to pick this up and i think i need to uh i'll just keep it muted actually it's it's fine although the audio is good because it's vanillaware um the the thing that stands out to me about this game that's interesting is they they struck a strange balance between Ooh, we've narrative got some and green combat. from your screen. Oh Chances no, the are... green the green issue again. Yeah. That's pretty funny. Is that better? Nope. Balls. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, let me try not sharing and then sharing once again. This may resolve the technical difficulty. We shall see. You... Yeah, guess we'll see. Is that any good? I mean, so far it's fine. It took a few seconds for it to go green before. All right, so I'll leave that there. Time. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. But in any case, uh, even if it goes green, I'll just stop. You know, I'll just talk over it. But uh, you can see the Vanillaware art style and how it's mm -hmm. evolved. Um, they, you know, it still very much looks like this art director, whoever it is or whoever they are. Um, you know, might have been just plucked straight out of uh, Odin Sphere and mm -hmm. uh, Muramasa Demon Blade. Um, but this is a very different setting, which is a nice thing that they do. They don't really retread uh, genres very much. Uh, this is high school kids from Japan uh, stuck in a strange time travel, uh, like dystopic, like sci-fi setting. Um, broadly speaking, what happens as setup, because this game is narrative heavy, so I really don't want to get into details, is that um, pretty much immediately the game introduces you to what is going on in like an exciting fashion, which is these things that they call kaiju, but actually look more like robots, are attacking. So here you can actually see the ta tactical combat layer of the game. Um, and a bunch of teenagers answer the call and like tr teleport into their mechas to go beat the hell out of them right classic kaiju stuff um pretty much immediately the story starts uh pulling from tropes but then mm -hmm. also like doing its own thing and part of what's yeah. really nice about this narrative is how much it keeps you on your toes like mm -hmm. you just you're kind of always trying to figure out what's going on and right, right. You're and, and, kind of always a little bit wrong. Right. I, I want to like step back just a second and say, you, you know there's time travel pretty much immediately because at first you're dealing with a future apocalypse that you're trying to stop. And that might be a future many years from now. But what it looks you find future. That, you're actually at 85 at the beginning of the game. <laughs> that's true. That's true. But um, it, you find out over time that the other high school children that you assume are just normal classmates, like these various children have come from different eras of time and their experiences may have been quite different and they may also have lost their memories. Yeah. So there's all sorts of weird stuff going on where, where you almost can't believe many of these narrators because mm -hmm. there are things they don't know about themselves, don't know about their friends. Yes. And what I think this game really deserves a lot of merit for and definitely deserves that nomination for best narrative is that they took so much complexity in like what is actually going on 
And what matters though, to keep it grounded and accessible and fun is your agency in choosing one of, as you progress later on in the game, up to 13 characters who all have their own perspective, attitude, and POV on everything that's going on. So in one person's POV, a literal cat is speaking to her and gives her a magical gun that is that like and gives her a mission to go around shooting all these people to suppress them because they are witches. And in another character, you will see something that looks just like that magical gun. And it'll actually like they'll just call it like a, a weapon, you know, just that POV right. shift. And they'll be really... like, yeah, the, the, the gun with the nano machines. Right. Like and they so... understand what's happening in a way that the first character doesn't seem to. Or, or is being fed a strange way of saying it, right? By, by the, right. by the cat. So like, it, it, it's, it's fascinating to jump between characters or focus on one character for a certain period of time. And that agency you have is like, it just kind of works regardless of what, you pick choose to do partly because they they do gate certain bits of the story until you accomplish certain tasks such as getting x percent completion with y number of characters on their stories um so that you have or or completing a battle for example. or completing some of the battles in a tactical yeah. layer i will say that uh you're probably going to be spending 70% of your time in cutscenes, uh, like doing the narrative part of the game. And they keep your agency there so that you're kind of hooked into it, but it is still very much a mostly non-interactive narrative during that yeah. part of the I, game. I gotta say, I can see why this game hasn't like mass caught on because you have to both really enjoy narrative storytelling and, and talking to characters. Uh, and at the same time, you also have to pretty well enjoy strategy type games. Well, I don't know that you have to enjoy strategy games because the biggest critique from what I've seen in the reviews is that the tactical layer was quite boring for most of the reviewers. They were probably playing on normal. I will say that I am playing this on hard and I find it engaging and I find the interface awesome like it really puts you in the shoes of the situation with just the right amount of detail because the city is fully rendered but it creates this grid-like system where you can't jump over buildings unless you're a plane and the space is fully analog it's not like a, a fire emblem where there's discrete spaces for Squares. units to take up yeah. so because everything is kind of minimalistic and has this god view with like a really interesting art design behind it you can have a stupid amount of enemies because they're just these little blips but then you have really good art if you like look at the little pop-up for them mm -hmm. and it really just translates to an experience that makes you feel so small and yet if you choose the characters that are right for the mission you can obliterate like 80 guys in one shot by using the right attack and that just feels so fucking cool yeah but you can also find that one of your mechs takes damage and is running low on health and yeah there are consequences for overtaxing your pilots so there is there you have skin in the game for sure it's hard enough for you i i think i always go back to that core tenet of like how many actually tactically interesting decisions that am I making per minute? And I actually think that, especially on hard mode, this game does push you to that, but you, I basically almost never have failed. So the story keeps chugging along. So it really is that narrative that is the core of the game, both in terms of the amount of time you spend, but it's also just the focus of the game. The tactical layer is there, it's beautiful, and it has some depth, and it's very novel, because this genre has kind of died out, like the kind of tactical yeah. mech war, although there was a good game a couple of years ago on PC. It's very but... pretty. This kind of game was common-ish back in a 2D gaming era, right? but it hasn't been done well in 3D style. And I think it's ballsy that they went for this, because you have to, to to achieve the scale the feeling of scale you have to take you know the the, the iconic mechs and the iconic yeah. kaijus of the genre and make them little blips which is kind of a yeah. dare, daring choice creative right and i want to take that back a little bit starcraft is actually pretty good 
we'll give that a pass. They're they're pretty good. For but sure, how long but has it been like since there was a new StarCraft relative. game? Yeah, that's I, part of the problem. This, this game does a lot of the modern RPG stuff where it blends mm. turn based and real time by having all of your actions um, have you know uh, some amount of startup potentially and some amount of cooldown potentially, and all of that is in real time. And at the end of an engagement. Um, in terms of real time, that whole fight might have taken place over like two minutes, but you might have actually been like really racking your brain for like 15 minutes, which makes it feel, again, this sense of scale because mm. the very quickly you learn that like the stakes are, you know, because of all the timey, wimey shit that's going on, the stakes are like the, the, the fate of all mankind throughout time. <laughs> right. right. Yep. So it's yep. it's pretty gnarly. It's a very interesting game. I think that well, you better uh, stop that auto play. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that um you know I look forward to finishing it. Uh I think I will finish it. Um I haven't played it in a little while, but like that narrative is still there and I still remember like what's going on. And I'm just I'm genuinely you amazed. You wanna find out about the magical gun i do i'm genuinely <laughs> amazed that like the way that they f for how much freedom you have to tackle the story in like whatever way you want and fight when you want and do story whenever you want like mm -hmm. it still feels like i'm never i never fully know what's happening in this world and i'm always like learning something each time i play a chapter i'll just edit it to my wish list <laughs> nice. Yeah, it seems like this might be right up your alley, James, considering how much you like your Gundams and Gundams. Uh, well, but while these aren't quite the same thing, uh, it kind of adds a pretty cool intrigue factor what? into the cool factor of having these kids that are like somehow special, but they don't know why. But that means they get to yeah. pilot these giant robots and save the city. It's what, pretty cool. what I think they narratively cracked is like in a game format, which you can't do this on TV or movie or whatever, like they figured out how to do a very deep ensemble. Yeah. But, and they but, all have their own like little special abilities in yeah. addition to being broad types. You might have their own personality gives them the ability to be excel at Absolutely. something in particular. The, the tactical layer influences their character, influences your understanding of the world. It's it's all interwoven really well. And and I mm -hmm. think like you know, if you watch like Lost or Heroes, right, there's always that quote unquote danger that the next episode would focus on a character that you personally don't give a shit about. And in this game, there's a certain amount of eat your vegetables. You have to like get <laughs> you have you have to experience X amount of this person's story in order to like get through the next gate or whatever. Right. right, right. But I think that each chapter is so discreet that I could really <laughs> see you going through this just one evening at a time, just focusing yeah. on it. Yeah, would, I've would gone through this. this Go ahead. So would you call this a narrative XCOM? Um, broadly speaking, yes. It's it's nowhere near as focused on the tactical aspect as XCOM, which we're, we're just time-wise, you, you know. Yeah. Unless you like play levels over to try and make, do them better, which you yeah, can I guess do, you could guess. you could you could always replay any any level, um, and if you really like that stuff. That's cool. Maybe there'll be like an even harder difficulty that gets unlocked, and that might be fun after I'm done with the story. I don't know, but um, yeah. I've played some like older games like that, like your mm -hmm. like the Sui Codins. Gotcha. Yeah. Like like there's a typical J J RPG mm -hmm. tactical version yes. of a game like that. But even that something like Valkyria focuses on four or five characters. This is like full on. Like there are thirteen characters who are incredibly Very important different. and a whole like ring of side characters that overlap in all of their stories in weird ways like the you suey codons do... are kind of like that if you if right, you've ever heard yeah. of the suey codon series mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they're kind of like that they're very, like very big tactical rpgs with like hundred with like hundreds of characters like, yeah it, it's impressive i think characters right i think this game really That's like right. has a really nice sweet spot where like it's cute to say like you can play the 100 characters but at some point some of that stuff is going to be less quality and it's hard to navigate yeah. as a player this is really interesting because like there might be a character i don't like but i'm still fascinated by the fact that a side character from this character's pov is framed as a good guy but then from this other pov is kind of framed as a bad guy and it's just Darwich. it's just fun it's yeah it's yeah there's really one character that i find to be a little vapid in that most of her plot changes take place depending on whether she goes to eat this kind of food or that kind of food. Yeah. And I find that just kind of humorous and bizarre. Um, but because the other characters in her story are really intriguing, 
I kind of don't care. I'm still well, there's, cool watching her storyline. There's so many um, loops in, in the structure that feel like you're doing a Groundhog's Day kind of thing as you continue mm-hmm. to play as that character. It just so happens that Iori is like, ice cream like again. do you guys oh. want to go eat ice cream or do you guys want to go eat crepes? <laughs> and like, there's like four branches from this strange decision. And, and you really don't want to think it's important, but maybe it actually is because maybe at the crepe store, she's going to meet somebody and they're going to interact with one of her friends and who knows, you know, yeah, you, that's, you can't rule it out, man. But that's part of what's maddening about it, honestly. Like, it, it, it's a weird narrative to be immersed in because it's just like when you click on a character on some level, you go like, ah, this shit again. And then something yeah. weird happens and you're just like, you learn something new and you're intrigued. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. that yeah, is yeah. it for, for 13 Sentinels. And that is it for... And that is it for... For us. How to chat peoples. It's been a fun, <laughs> it's been a fun day. Indeed, indeed. Well, All right, so let's can... call it a, an afternoon for us. <laughs> yeah, for, for James, it might still be morning. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's 11.15 in California. We are potty chat peoples. We are technically a podcast, but also a YouTube thing. And uh, we have a website now. That's cool. Um, Moving up in the world. Yeah. Party dash chat dash peoples dot com. Yes, peoples plural. <laughs> yeah. Just All like right. The logo. Until next time.